Good morning. I want to welcome you to our service this morning. And I know there are few of us because of the weather and um, still those that are staying home. And so I'm thankful for those of you who are here. I'm thankful for those of you that are watching. Um, this morning is going to be a little different in the sense that uh, we're, we have the privilege of hearing from uh, Pastor Will this morning. So this is my only opportunity to speak. But uh, I do want to thank you for being here. And I'm looking forward to this service today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. God, we are thankful for um, all that you do for us. We're thankful for your faithfulness to us. We're, we're thankful for the safety you gave to uh, those who are able to be here this morning. And I know that there are others who desire to be here but um, thought it safe to be at home, uh, either for health purposes or because of the snow. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you will just help us today to have a, just a great time uh, worshiping you. Lord, that we will grow through the study of your word. And Lord, as uh, Pastor Will comes up and preaches on, on the topic of faith, Lord, I pray that you will um, just give him power from your spirit. Lord, we are grateful for how you work and guide in our lives. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to read to you just one verse. It says in, in Psalms 100, uh, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. And that's what we're going to do at this time together. If you would, please go ahead and join me in standing. I would encourage you, if you're watching online, uh, please, if you haven't, join us in singing. Go ahead and join us while we sing. We're not going to be able to hear you, obviously. But it is still a blessing to be able to sing praises to God, whether or not you are here physically. But since those of you that are here, let's sing out together. Let's sing together. Crown him with many crowns.
Bible singing this morning. What we're going to do right now is we're going to pray together and thank God for the continued giving towards the, towards the church. If you would please bow your heads and let's praise God together. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we don't often think about it this way, Lord, but I want to thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have of giving back to you. The privilege that we have of giving of what we have from you back to be used, Lord, um, not just to maintain our building, Lord, that, that, that is important, but Lord, what is most important is the ministry to people, Lord. So we thank you for the continued giving to be able to do that, Lord. But as always, Lord, I pray that we would not just give financially. I pray that we would um, seek out different ways that we are able to give of ourselves and of our lives um, of, our, of our hands, of our mouths, of our minds. Uh, we would seek out different ways to be able to serve and give towards our church, each other, and our community around us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you would, please, let's sing together our next song, Our Great Savior. sing our next song. We're going to do our scripture reading today corporately. As per usual, I'll read the first slide. You can read the second slide until we finish our passage. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them 
at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in the heavenly realms. Oh, excuse me. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's sing together, There is a Redeemer. Sit down, please. Have a seat. Why don't we take some moments right now and pray before our final song, preparing our hearts for the message we're about to hear from the Word of God.
Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. I want to praise your name right now, Lord, for your attributes, your character that remains consistent, never changing. Lord, we are, um, we should be very humbled when we look at everything you are in comparison with everything that we are not. Lord, I ask that our hearts would be made sensitive to your word this morning. Lord, I know that there are so many little things that nag at us, that want to pull our attentions and our, our hearts and our thoughts away from you in general throughout the week, but even right now, Lord, I, I know there are things that are nagging at people to think about and different ideas. Lord, I ask that you would calm our hearts and our minds to be focused in on your truth. Lord, I pray that it would just be your truth that is preached this morning. Lord, I pray that as we sing this final song before the sermon today, I pray that we would be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that we would be reminded, Lord, of the severity of the jump, God, that you made through Jesus to come down to earth and provide such a sacrifice, such a perfect lamb for our sakes. I pray that we would be reminded of that and that that would spur us on to a deeper and more intense and fierce love for you that cannot be taken away, that can't be tempered or put out by cultural or social happenings. Lord, I pray that as we sing, I pray that we would remember, even myself, Lord, that we are singing praise to you, not, not for the worship of anyone else but you. And we're also singing to encourage each other, Lord. So I pray that as we sing, that we would be passionate with our singing, even when we are not passionate, that we would understand that your word is worthy of attention and that you are worthy of glory. That's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. If you would please join me in standing. We'll sing one last song together, Living Hope.
It is my privilege to preach today. I always enjoy opportunities to preach. Um, I, we we're going to start off here in a moment, but before we get started, I would like to spend a few moments in prayer with you, asking for the Lord's guidance this morning. So if you would, please bow your heads as we pray. Lord, I, I thank you for the privilege that we have of your word and looking into it and studying it together and diving into it. Lord, I pray that um, as, Lord, I preach, Lord, I ask, Lord, um, as boldly as I can, Lord, that it would not be me preaching, that it, would, that it would be Christ speaking to us. I pray that I would just preach the text and nothing else. But I ask, Lord, for our church, our congregation here physically and those that are here with us online, even those that are watching this down the road, Lord, I ask that no one would exclude themselves from the message. I pray that no one would uh, hold back any kind of confrontation that there might be from the, your Holy Spirit in their lives. Lord, I do ask, Lord, that we would uh, learn truth, but that we would not just learn it today, but that we would learn it for the purpose of taking it with us, packaging it up, storing it in our minds, and bringing it with us this week to meditate on and to think about and pray through. Lord, I ask that uh, your word would change us this morning. I, I believe, Lord, that we desperately need heart change at the core of who we are. So what I, I ask for myself even, all of us here, Lord, that we would walk away changed this morning to understand more of you and what you uh, Lord, require of us as your family, as your children. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The topic of today's message is going to be on faith, sola fide. So if you remember, several months ago, uh, Pastor Pete said we were going to start a series working through the five solas, and we are just now getting to the end of it. This will be the, the final one, talking about faith this morning from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. But the the message today is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be from the passage, and we are going to be talking about faith. But rather than having a message about what faith is, we're actually going to be talking about what comes with faith, what faith provides for us, what faith kind of accompanies and ushers into our lives, the righteousness of God. So as we, uh, before we dive into that, I would like to share a quick, quick story with you. Back during the Civil War era, there was a law where a black slave could earn enough money from his master to actually buy their own freedom. It was not very common, uh, but it was a, a, a law and it was the ability that if the master allowed to pay them, they could earn up enough money to purchase their own freedom. So during, during Sherman's infamous march to the sea, the army encountered a former black slave who had already saved up enough money and he purchased his own freedom. Now, during Sherman's march to the sea, they passed by this now free man, and he saw them, they began to talk to him, and he said uh, to the soldiers, if I'd have known you gunmen were coming, I'd have saved my money. We live in a different era than the Civil War, and we have lived in it for about 2,000 years. This era that we live in is called the era of the New Covenant. Now, in this era, we are all slaves. We are slaves to sin. Unlike the Civil War area, we actually are not able to, like that slave who purchased his own freedom, because of this, sla this slavery that you and I experienced to sin, it is impossible for us to purchase our own freedom. We're bound to it. But the good news is that we don't have to purchase our own freedom because Jesus has already paid the bill in full. See, you and I have the chance to experience freedom, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ, which will be the topic of what we're talking about today. So if you haven't already, please open up to Romans chapter 3. We'll be reading there in a moment. It's always good to provide some context to a passage. I never like jumping into a passage right away without providing some kind of stuff that's going on leading up to it. So um, Paul has spent nearly two chapters at the beginning of Romans explaining why the law is an insufficient answer to the universal human problem we call sin. So the law is basically what what every other religion puts forward. Um, uh, every religion puts forward some kind of list, some kind of law of things to do and say 
Uh, so do these things, and if you do them, you will be loved. That's how a false religion, that's how false faiths work. They, they work off from this, this false premise. I obey, therefore I am accepted. That's how uh, every other religion you look at, they will, it, that is the false premise that I obey, therefore I am accepted. See, the problem with that false teaching is twofold. Uh, the first problem is that you can't change the substance of your heart simply by giving it laws and rules to follow. You will not change the inside of yourself, your heart, by simply following a set of rules. Any more than you can change uh, a, a palate to like something that someone does not like. Uh, for instance, if you were to uh, command me to fall in love with Qdoba, I would not like that. Because we all know Chipotle is the preferred burrito place on the planet. But simply you commanding me to do that would not actually change my palate. It wouldn't change what I like, my preferred burrito joint. But uh, that's the, that kind of in a weird way. I had to throw Chipotle in there somewhere. An understanding for you to understand that um, you cannot change someone by simply telling someone to do something. What you can do is you can, uh, you can teach through that, but you're not going to change the substance of someone's heart because you put a list of rules or expectations on there. So the, the, the false teaching of I obey, therefore I am accepted, that's the first problem. The second problem with the, this idea is that what Paul really focuses on today in our passage. Our sin leaves us legally guilty before God. And no amount of good works can repair the damage that's been done. Imagine someone broke into your house and destroyed some of your most valuable things. And uh, they managed to get away, but it didn't take them too long to get very far before Andrew Hines comes bursting in, arrests them bring them before the court. That person will go stand before a judge, and as that person stands before a judge, he could talk as much as he wants about how good person he is, all the good he's done, how dedicated he is at the local soup kitchen, at the food pantry, providing and helping for people. And you would even maybe respond like, that's great, but that doesn't restore what they have destroyed of yours, right? He's still legally guilty of his crime, no matter the good elsewhere he has done. Sin violates and destroys in the universe and overturns, uh, uh, seeks to overturn God's justice. A justice is a very important concept to understand because a justice that God tells us is the foundation of his creation. For creation to, to be good and for God to be true to his own character, justice has to be upheld on his part. So Paul explains that all the law is able to do is to show us how messed up our sinful hearts actually are. What the law's purpose is to show us our need of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have the time right now to read through Romans 2 and 3 fully, but there's something that you're supposed to be feeling as you're reading through the beginning of Romans. So I, I'm sure many of you have read through the beginning of Romans, but as you read through the beginning... Uh, you're supposed to be feeling completely overwhelmed and completely pressured by the immense requirements that are placed by the law. We should be feeling overwhelmed after reading about the amount and the depth of our sin from Romans chapter 2 and 3. Everywhere we turn, we find more and more guilt and corruption. We look at our bad deeds and we see that they are full of anger and selfishness and rebellion. Then we see what we thought were our good deeds, and actually what we see from our good deeds is actually just pride and competitiveness and jealousy. And once we recognize that, once we recognize this, then we can finally fully understand what Paul said, "O wretched man that I am. I am completely stained with sin." So we are left feeling overwhelmed and under immense pressure by the weightiness of our own sin, which brings us to how the righteousness of God is made known to us. Found in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So maybe you're wondering, 
why Paul, our author, suddenly decides to stop focusing on all these requirements of the law and how the law was meant to uh, put pressure on us to realize that we need Christ. Um, he changes it in a drastic way and starts emphasizing the righteousness of God. Why is that? Why is that? Well, there's a specific reason for that, and it's because, as we see later on, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, contrary to popular cultural opinion or whatever some celebrity pastor might put out there, God's standards are perfect and unwavering. No matter how much you would like to change them, they don't change. So from there, we see mankind's dilemma. God's standards are so unattainable that all people left to their own abilities will be rightly and justly condemned. That's, that's why we, I mentioned before, it is so important for God to remain true to his character and be just and to judge sin justly. So this is why verse 21 begins talking of the righteousness of God so strongly. Because of this, we must have God's righteousness to be right with God. We can't get that on our own. That's not possible. Our dilemma is there is no righteousness within ourselves or in this world to help us. See, true God accepting righteousness is only found through faith in Jesus Christ. Hence why I mentioned before, today was not just going to be a discussion about uh, faith itself, but it's about what faith ushers in with it the righteousness of God. The reality is that we, you and I, are so far gone that we think that a good deed or two will make up for actual sin. Remember, only God's level of righteousness is sufficient to satisfy his justice. Only God's level of righteousness is sufficient to satisfy his justice. So then the question is, how is the righteousness of God made known? How is it revealed? How is it transferred to us? Well, the answer here is in verse 22. It says this, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now let's take a few moments and consider, I'd like to consider some of the specifics about the righteousness of God. First of all, when we look at the righteousness of God, we have to understand that it is given to us through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not a standard that we either meet or don't meet. It is actually given. It's a gift. God takes his very own righteousness and gives it to us as his free gift. Absolutely no works are involved in this. So understand that. And secondly, God's righteousness is unique in its power. His righteousness not only makes us holy in his sight by fulfilling the law's demands, but it also reaches back into time to cleanse our sin because we were declared righteous. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, what that's called. So the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, which has been given to us, pays the penalty for our sin. That's how it's unique, removing the wrath of God. And the last aspect of the righteousness of God, I'd like us to understand, is that it does last forever. Psalm 119, 142 says this, Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Think about that sometime. Uh, we're going to keep moving, but I would encourage you to meditate on that fact that the righteousness of God lasts forever. Um, because when you dwell on that, just the fact that God's righteousness lasts forever and that you get to experience God's righteousness through Jesus Christ, through faith in him, that alone should make your jaw hit the floor. It doesn't always, because as, as people, we lose our awe in things sometimes. But I would encourage you to med meditate on the uh, Eterna, the, the eternal aspect of the righteousness of God. It lasts forever. So God's righteousness given to us in Christ is forever. So God's righteousness has been made known through faith in Jesus Christ. And then what Paul does in verse 23 uh, is very graciously, like Paul usually does in his letters, he reminds us of our problem. He reminds us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, another translation of this verse I found interesting actually says this. It says, um, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Uh, it's a unique way of thinking about it when you, when you, when you pause. Um, 
One, th one thing that I think helps us understand this passage, at least that helped me understand this passage, uh, is uh, the falling short of the glory of God is the, the sinned idea, which we're going to park on the word sinned in a moment. But the idea that falling short is supposed to convey, an, it's actually an archery term when you look in the, in the original Greek. It's an archery turn, term, and it's meant to be when you're aiming down at your target and you shoot the arrow and you just, you know, if the bullseye is right here, you just miss. You just miss the mark. That's the idea that's meant to be conveyed. Like you're trying, but you're just missing. But uh, maybe you've heard that illustration before, uh, but a, a more accurate representation of this for falling short of the glory of God is not us aiming at the target and just slightly missing. This is us aiming down the target and then because of our sin, we end up turning this direction and shooting the opposite way. That's how completely opposed us by nature are to God before Christ. So it's not just saying we've sinned a little bit and fallen a little bit short of the glory of God. Rather than aiming at the target, we turn around ahead and shoot the other direction. It's important for us to understand that. So the term sinned is, um, is universal, referring to all the sins of the human race from the beginning of time until now. We all stand guilty before a holy God and deserve his judgment. Now the reasons for this is that we have fallen short, which is a, a present tense verb indicating the present results of the fact of sin. So in other words, the state in which we find ourselves right now, we cannot meet the standards of God's righteousness on our own. As I said before, we need God's righteousness to assuage God's standard. One author puts it this way, the, the harlot, the liar, the murderer are short of God's standards, but so are you. Perhaps they are at the bottom of the mine and you are at the crest of an alp but you are as little able to touch the stars as they. Praise God for his grace by presenting us the righteousness that he has transferred to us through faith in Jesus Christ. So we've looked at how the righteousness of God has been made known. It's been made known through faith in the one and only Jesus Christ, the Savior. Now let's take a look at the righteousness of God and how it has been finalized. So what is meant by the righteousness of God finalized? Uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, there's an important word here that we need to pause on, and it's the word justified. That's the word that Martin Luther decided to launch the Protestant Reformation with. You see, the Roman Catholic Church uh, I, I'm sure being in such a heavily Catholic area, many of you are familiar with the, the teachings of the, of the Catholic Church. Um, but in, the, in Luther's day, and even today for many, uh, the Roman Catholic Church taught that justification, being justified, was a process where God actually made you a righteous person by infusing his righteousness into you by means of of the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. So there's, there's baptism, there's the Eucharist, there's confirmation, etc. That is how uh, the Catholic Church taught and teaches that, that um, justification is infused to you. So eventually, through observing the sacraments and confession and doing good, you will become a righteous enough person that God would declare you justified. And if by the time you died... You weren't righteous enough, you'd go to what is called purgatory, where your sin would be purged from you through fire and suffering, hence purgatory. This, they taught, was the process of justification. But Luther pointed out that's not what the word justified means and not how justification actually works. Just see, justification means a legal declaration that happens all at once. That's a definition of justification, a legal declaration that happens all at once. So justification is not a process whereby, whereby we become righteous. Justification is a pronouncement whereby we are declared righteous all at once. So justification does not refer to the transformation of our heart. That is sanctification. Justification is a declaration made by God. So in justification, God's righteousness is not infused into us, it's imputed to us. It's credited to our account. So if I get accused of a crime and I am hauled into court and the jury decides I am innocent of all the charges and the judge declares me not guilty, all at once, I'm cleared. 
all at once, that's what happens. I am justified. He's not giving me a seven-step process to become justified, to become innocent, but he declares all at once, you're free. You are innocent of these charges, just as if it never happened. As a Bible, Bible scholar, Douglas Moo states this, this judicial verdict of justification for which one had to wait until the last judgment, according to Jewish theology, is, according to Paul, rendered the moment a person believes. That is amazing. That is amazing to think about, that we are justified through faith in Jesus Christ the moment you, your faith is in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is finalized through justification in the life of a believer. That means it's instant the moment you are brought to life in Jesus Christ. So the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus is applied to the believer instantly. There's no process for being justified. Thank God. Uh, I, 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 let me share with you something that I personally need to be reminded of from time to time. Um, let me, I'll share this with you, and maybe you have experienced this yourself from, uh, in different ways. If you haven't, you get to listen anyway. Uh, there's this little thing that happens to me, and sometimes to us as, as Christ followers, and it's this. We have days that um, we are feeling great, right? We have days where we are following after Jesus Christ passionately. We're pursuing him with everything that we have. We're not holding anything back. Uh, I have days like this where, um, this is not every day, but I have, a, I have days like this where I, I, I wake up and I pursue Christ with everything I have. I, I, I come into the office, I get a lot of work done, I'm loving and leading my family well, caring for them, I'm praying for people throughout the day, I'm spending time in the Word, I'm loving it, I'm cherishing it, meditating on truth throughout the day. It's great. Maybe you've experienced days like that, where it's just like you feel intimately close with your Savior, Jesus Christ. What happens is kind of sneaky, though. The, uh, things will be going so great, and I will start to think, man, God is so awesome. I am so thankful I get to serve God and be a part of his family. I feel so close to him today. But wait for it. Wait for it. What happens is that in some small way, in the back of my mind, I started thinking, he must be happy with me today because I feel so close to him. It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's ridiculous. You know, like these days that like just feel so awesome. You feel like you're on cloud nine, and then you, and then you start thinking in the very deepest parts of your brain, because no one wants to actually think this out loud and say this out loud, like God must be so happy with me today. Uh, and the only reason I knew that those little thoughts were creeping into my mind um, was because the opposite thought sneaks into my mind on days when I don't feel close to God. Maybe you've had these days as well. Not maybe. You've had these days as well. Everyone has. Every follower of Christ has. Days where I'm struggling in my mind. Things are not adding up for me as a believer. Days where I don't want to get out and serve people. Days where I don't want to call and encourage a brother in Christ. Days where uh, I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to lead and love my family as best as I can as a, as a follower of Christ. And in those days, I get this little thought in the back of my head that says, God must be disappointed in me today. I don't know if you guys have ever felt that before. The only reason I knew that these thoughts started to creep into my mind was after a time of prayer one time when I was just, uh, it was one of those off days uh, where I wanted to pursue Christ, I just, it was a, a struggle of a day. And I was praying, and that thought crept up to the forefront of my mind, and I thought, wow, God must be unhappy with me today. Hmm. I don't know if you guys have ever, ever experienced that before. In case you've caught yourself doing the same exact thing, let me encourage you with what I had to say to myself. Stop. <laughs> Stop. This is, this is poor theology. This is poor practice of your faith in Christ. This is not the point of justification. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. When so many, uh, I've had this question from, from teens, adults, kids, uh, whatever it is. This is the, the, the process of taking theology and bringing it into your everyday life and making it a part of your thinking every single day, which is the understanding of justification and that it is not based on what you do. You have been declared righteous by God. God declaring you righteous. 
Your justification is not contingent on your ability to perform as a follower of Jesus Christ. Thank God, because if it was contingent on your ability to perform, first of all, you would have never received it. Secondly, you would lose it within a minute. It'd be gone. And actually, the, the way in which God looks at you and me on our worst day is the same way he looks at you and I on our best day. That is something that you need to understand. That's something that I, I have to understand is that um, our salvation, our justification is not based on how, you, how intimate you feel with your Savior that day. Because what that can do is that can actually drive you in an opposite direction. That can actually drive you towards uh, making a list, getting that list done as a, as a follower of Christ. I prayed for 10 minutes. I read my Bible for 20 minutes. Uh, I, I called someone and encouraged them today. I served in uh, tiny tots. I'm good. I'm close with God today. That can become a major distraction and actually a harm. When you belong to God, he delights in you just as much all the time. He delights in his children. He longs to hear from his children, to hear the prayers of his children. Now, because God delights in us all the time, that doesn't give us permission to sin. What that does is actually gives you permission to stop relying on your own understanding and your own ability to perform as a Christian and start trusting God when he says that you have been declared justified. The righteousness of God given to you by faith in Jesus Christ immediately applied to your account as if you'd never sinned. And this is done through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Back in verse 24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, all who believe are placed in right standing with God and all who believe are declared righteous, still based on the fact that all have sinned and we see that to be just in God's sight must come from somewhere else. Galatians 2.16 says this, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So back in verse 24, we have another word that we need to pause on. And that is redemption. To redeem. It says through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redeem means, uh, many of you could quote this, to buy back, to purchase back, something back, to bring it back from destruction, to restore it. So people use this word to redeem when they buy something back like at a pawn shop. So if you fall on hard times and you need money and you take you, your in, engagement ring, if you uh, can get enough money, uh, if you need the money, you go sell it to a pawn shop. And then if you're able to get enough money, you go and purchase that engagement ring back. You've brought it back and you've purchased it back. That's redemption. That's redeeming it. Or we use the word when we talk about some, something as simple as a, a, a coupon. A coupon, right? What do you call it when you trade in a coupon? You, you redeem it, right? You are given a cash equivalent for that coupon. The point is that Jesus paid the full price to buy us back, to redeem us from condemnation to sin. He offered it to us freely, but it wasn't free, was it? It cost him everything. And you are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is so important for us to remember that our faith is not tied to your ability to save yourself, even after you have Christ. But that does not give you an ex a, a excuse to not live out your faith. I would like to spend uh, our, 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 the last part of the sermon talking about uh, a little bit different approach to the application of the message. I would like to talk about how you can give life to your faith. How you can give life to your faith and why it's important to give life to your faith. Because as followers of Christ, it's really easy to become distracted in your walk with Christ. It's very easy to become focused on side things. I believe most in this room, maybe most watching, have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. But maybe you haven't fully activated it yet. Let me explain what I mean by that. 
uh, answer this for me. When was the last time that you prayed for something that to our earthly minds seemed absolutely impossible? When was the last time you prayed for something like that? See, the Bible is chock full of these uh, heroes of the faith, you know, that, that made these huge prayers that God just came swooping in, answered them. He led them down the right path, saving his people left and right. And it's, it's awesome when you look at the whole picture leading up to Jesus Christ. But uh, it's really easy to overlook the fact that actually you can ask big things of a big God. But sometimes we get a little bit scared to, right? Why is that? Why is that, I wonder? Well, at least for myself, I think a large portion of that is actually because our faith is little. Our faith in what God can do is little. So we, so we, we pray for little things. We pray for just tiny things. Like, Lord, it'd be great if traffic was, easy, was not that heavy on the way home. I mean, I don't have a long trip to get home. But, <laughs> uh, but those that travel to work, you know. Uh, we, we pray for little things, like, um, and not that these are insignificant things, but we pray for little things, like, um, Lord, I really, really would like this doctor's appointment to go well today. Now, does that mean that those things are insignificant? No, of course not. It's good to pray for those things. In everything you do, pray. A theme throughout, a theme throughout the New Testament very heavily, very strongly. But... As I said before, when was the last time you prayed for something big in faith? God's big. He can handle big prayers. When was the last time you sat down and you intensely thought through different ways that you could be sharing the gospel with your neighbor? Because guess what? That actually takes faith. A faith to understand that sharing the gospel with your neighbor uh, can be scary. And it could be difficult. And maybe you just don't know them that well, and you're just waiting for that perfect time to show up. Uh, but it takes faith because you're trusting that God is going to be the one that does the saving and not you, right? When was the last time you prayed for God to give you a deep passion for your city? For your city, whether you live here in Mishawaka, you live in South Bend, wherever it is. Maybe you have faith in Jesus, but you haven't even begun to tap the full potential of what that faith could be, what it could look like. Do you pray in faith? Do you pray in faith? You know, we pray so much um, for the health and well-being of those in our church, our friends, those in our community, uh, our family. Uh, and that those, these are good things to be praying for, to be constantly lifting up to God, uplifting in prayer. But maybe we pray for these things almost exclusively so often that we forget to pray and ask God to save 100 people in Mishawaka from our church this year. Have you, ever, have you ever prayed that prayer? For God to specifically save at least 100 people this year through our church. Does that seem impossible to you? Big prayers for a big God. Do you pray in faith? Maybe you've... Um, uh, you, maybe you've forgotten to pray that God would make you so desperate for a close relationship with him that there's nothing you wouldn't do to be close to him. There's nothing that could pull you away from God. Have you prayed for that kind of intimacy with your creator? It's easy to forget that. Maybe you've forgotten to pray for your family in a big way. Maybe you have a, a family member immediate or further out that you think is just so far gone, so far away from Christ, that there's nothing that can be done? Have you prayed a big prayer that God save this person? Use me to save this person. Not for your own glory, but for God's. Praying in faith is immensely, Im immensely uh, incorporated into the Christian walk. We need to pray in faith because... Uh, Prayer is not just a list that we create and we ask for God to, to do for us. Prayer is communion with God and trusting that we have a big enough God for our prayers. And we do. When's the last time that you prayed that God would end the abortion industry? 
When, in, in addition to praying uh, for the end of the abortion industry, maybe we should pray that God would give us the heart and the means to help those women that feel that abortion is their only option. Do you pray in full faith, remembering that everything our God is, is big enough? This is something that God has been working in me uh, slowly over a long period of time that I'm not asking big enough things of my God. Maybe you, felt you, maybe you found yourself in the same place. Do you pray in faith? Just because something seems too big to pray for doesn't mean that you shouldn't pray for it. We serve a big God. Give him big prayers. And I pray big prayers for our church. And not, not just generic prayers like, Lord, help our church you know, to, to grow. You know, not just in this or this way, but just in general way. I pray specific prayers for our church, for, for people in our church, for you that God would grow you individually closer to Jesus Christ, that God would grow you closer to people in the church because we need these things. These are big prayers and asking specifically is important. Give life to your faith. Give your faith some feet. So beyond just praying in faith, do you live out your life in faith? Do you live out your life in faith? Do you actively take big steps in your walk with God? Big steps. And what I mean by, what do I mean by that? I mean, do you live out your faith by taking steps that you know would glorify God, even if it means you're going to be uncomfortable? See, we are very tailored to think uh, in our world to avoid discomfort, to avoid anything that might make us feel weird or awkward. Um, <laughs> I remember uh, when I first got here with, with the teenagers during Sunday school, um, hopefully you guys remember this. Uh, maybe, I don't know. We, we were working through Sunday school, and we were working through uh, just real quick synopsis of the gospel. And it's through a specific book that has been referenced in here several times and talks about uh, the gospel in, in four different steps. It goes God, the creator, man, the sinner, Jesus, the savior, and then what's your response? And it's where the purpose was it to solidify in our hearts, but also to be able to share the gospel. And so what I did at the end of the study was I would have uh, we would do this little role playing, you know. I would have, I would ha uh, have the kids. We'd pick a, a scenario, and I would have everyone. I would be the unsafe person, and they would come up to me, and they would have to give me the gospel through using those four easy steps. You would, I wish I would have recorded some of these because they were hilarious. <laughs> Not because of the content of it, but because of how scared you can get, even when it's your pastor when you're giving the gospel. I mean. I mean, and we'd choose like goofy scenarios, you know, just funny things. But um, it's amazing uh, w to think of sharing the gospel by living out your faith, sharing the gospel, and how that even requires faith to take that first step. Because so many people have become so distracted to think that sharing the gospel means that I have to get my presentation of it perfect. See, the purpose of doing that with the teens was to teach the opposite. Your presentation does not need to be perfect. You can give the gospel in 30 seconds and stumble over every word along the way, and God's going to be the one that brings the increase, not you. Do you live out your life in faith, even by sharing the gospel, making, doing things that are uncomfortable to you? Let me ask this question. What does that look like to you to take big steps of faith? What does that look like? Some of you might have some examples in your own mind of what that means to take big steps of faith. Here are some examples if you need some encouragement to take big steps of faith. Sometimes a big step of faith is committing to not just reading your Bible consistently, but memorizing it. Hiding the word of God in your heart. That's crucial for any spiritual battle that you face. Your spiritual arsenal needs to be fully loaded to fight these battles. So maybe that's a big step of faith for you. Not just to read, but to memorize. Maybe another big step of faith is deciding to quit that one destructive, sinful habit that no one else knows about, but you know is destroying you. You know is hurting your faith in Jesus Christ. If you've ever been in one of those battles before, you know that is a big step of faith. That God would satisfy you just as much as that, just sin, that sinful habit. Maybe a big step of faith is uh, for some, it might be, like I said, sharing your faith with that one person that you just keep waiting and waiting and waiting for the perfect time to do it. 
Another possible big step of faith, and this one, this one personally gets me really, really excited, is purposely finding a way that you could build relationships with the people of Michiana, of, of Mishawaka, South Bend, the surrounding area, for the purpose of sharing the gospel. Now, this is, this is a, a, a personal uh, passion of mine, is that we as a church, that we would uh, find specific ways that we can take big steps of faith to reach our community. By the way, I just want to say that uh, I want God to do big things through First Baptist Church, and I believe that he can. I truly believe that if we are willing as a church to step out in faith, to show Christ to Mishawaka, to South Bend, God will bless that. I do believe that 100%. So I'm going to put a shameless plug in here, and I'd like you to pay attention. Uh, if you think that God's calling you to take that big step of faith, or if you have a passion for that and you want to do something like what I'm talking about, um, sharing Christ through whatever means you have, talk to me. Let's work this through together. I love talking about different ways that we can, as a church body, reach out to our city. Let's get together. Let's figure out a way that we can work together, use the resources that we have to get the gospel outside of these walls. Uh, you know what I would love to see? And Pastor Pete and I have talked about this and kind of dreamed about it here and there. What I would love to see would a full building, not on Sundays. <laughs> That's a little bit redundant, right? It doesn't make sense. Here's what I mean. I want you to come. Don't, don't think I'm telling you not to come to church. Please come to church. Um, what I'm talking about is actually uh, things like um, the impact basketball and soccer that we do. We do those on Thursday nights. What I would love to see is... Um, our facilities being used every single night of the week for a different purpose, to reach our community. Uh, like, like I said, Thursday nights are impact basketball. We have basketball from 4 to 6. Then we do soccer from 7 to 9 p.m. And I would love to see Monday night taken out by a, a, some kind of kids club after school. I'd love to see Tuesday night, maybe there's some members who want to start some kind of education classes for the community. And maybe they could be classes about um, uh, finance. Maybe it could be classes on, on coding. Maybe it could be uh, classes on public speaking. It could be anything. Then Wednesday maybe has something, and then Friday has something. Uh, we, have, we have great facilities for these things, and it, it is um, a little bit daunting to think about jumping into something like that. But how big is your faith? Is it big enough for that? then using all these avenues to share the gospel and to teach the love of Jesus Christ to Mishawaka. So please, again, a shameless plug. Uh, I've talked to a few people about this, but if you have a, a passion or a desire to take that big step of faith and use whatever you know, whatever is a hobby of yours, whatever it could be to reach out to Mishawaka, come talk to me. We'll make it work of some kind. If it's, if it's possible, we'll make it work. Um, I, I like talking to people uh, about when it comes to like impact basketball and soccer uh, with impact basketball it's myself and steve pachesny and it used to be alex pachesny but he's going to the uh, police academy right now so he can't be a part of it right now and then cody long but he's not coming because he won't stop having kids and so um but <clears throat> when it comes to impact basketball it's funny how it started uh it was an accident kind of uh there was kids playing in the in the parking lot like uh, right in front of my house at all hours of the night. Uh, but I just, I, I can't remember. I think, Steve, you might have been here with me, but we just asked them, like, hey, you want to go use the gym? And then two years later, we have a rotation of over, like, 75 or 100 kids that come, not every week, but, like, several scores of kids that have come through that still come uh, every once in a while, some that come every single week, that hear the gospel on a regular basis, that have good relationships with us, that look at our, at our church in a good way and in a positive light, and their parents uh, uh, that actually look at our church as a resource. Um, this is not to build myself up. Like I said, this was an accident that God just chose to make big. I, I make it a big step with soccer. I was meeting with a, a pastor in the area before we started Impact Soccer, and he's like, how do you know this is going to work? You want to know what I said? I said, I don't. <laughs> we, we'll have to see. It was a step of faith. It was a big step of faith, and even from that, we've had lots of people come through that, we, that uh, Joseph Freericks and I and Jonathan Lance comes every once in a while, 
And we were able to play with these people and talk with them. And I, we, we share short Bible talks with them. And these are important things. So let me ask you this question once again. Do you live out your life in faith that God can do big things? Some of these steps, some of, these steps of faith that I just mentioned are big steps of faith. But we serve a big God who has brought us from death to life through faith in Jesus Christ. That's a big step. And now God is calling you, take big steps of faith. Don't let your faith die. Give it life. Do something for Christ that makes you feel uncomfortable. Pray for something that seems so big it is impossible to happen. Step out in faith and reach out to that one person that you just don't want to, and they're the one person that nobody else will. I would love to see, like I mentioned, our church being used by God in a powerful way in our city and in the surrounding area. I I, I encourage you and I charge you to pray in that way. Make big prayer requests to God. He's big. He can handle them. So I charge you this week as we go into this world, unashamedly live out your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of it. Recognize that your faith brings with it the righteousness of God, and that has changed you. Live that way. Live as a changed follower of Jesus Christ. Let's ask God to, excuse me, to guide us toward that together as we enter into the week. Our God, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the salvation you provided to us by Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that you knew that it was only going to be your righteousness that would satisfy your judgment, your justice, your character. Lord, I thank you that from your righteousness, we are declared justified. Lord, I ask that we would not fall into the, the, the trap that it's so easy to fall into, that we think that your love or even just how you look at us is dependent on how we do each day. I pray that you'd protect us from that. Lord, I also ask that we would live out our faith in a big way. Lord, I, I long for you to use us. I long for you to, or to use First Baptist Church to reach our area with Christ. I long for you to use each person here that goes into their workplace. I, I long for you, Lord, to use them to, to show love and to share Christ and to share the saving faith of Jesus Christ with their friends and family. Lord, I want to make big steps of faith in my own life. I pray that our church would long for those big steps of faith and to see them answered in a big way because, God, you can do it. I've seen it before. I know it's possible. So, Lord, I pray that we would give life to our faith, that we would fully use our faith in Jesus Christ, Lord, for your glory and your pleasure. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Uh, For our closing song, if you would please stand with me together. We're going to close out our service and sing, Lord be glorified in my life. Excellent message, and I hope that you take that to heart and continue to ask God to build your faith. Um, Thank you, Will, for that.
Um, just want you to be aware next Sunday uh, that Larry and Sally Fogel will be here. There are missionaries, and they're going to be here presenting their ministry um, in the morning and also in, in the evening, and so I encourage you to be here for both of those if you can, um, and I know it'll be a great blessing. Their ministry has changed slightly, so they're excited to tell you about that, and they want you to be aware of that. Uh, I do have two requests that I'll pray for here before we have our announcement video. Um, Wilma Kaufman is having surgery on Wednesday on her heart, um, and so be in prayer for her. She's, uh, the functioning of her heart has been not been great, and so they need to go in and correct a couple things, and so be in prayer for her. Also be in prayer for uh, Steve and Julie Rios. They're flying back from Saudi Arabia today, uh, so be in prayer. Uh, as they come back, that uh, God will bless them and keep them safe. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for this opportunity we have to be here. Lord, we, uh, as we just heard, you are a God who uh, asks us to come in faith to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help us to do that. Lord, I do pray for Wilma, Lord, and the surgery that she has scheduled for this week. Um, God, I pray that you will give the doctors strength and, and wisdom and Lord, I just pray you'll give a calmness to Wilma. Um, Lord, I know it's, it's been a, a rough uh, last few months for her, and I pray that uh, you will just uh, strengthen her spiritually and emotionally. Lord, I just pray that you will be with the Rioses as they travel back. Give them safety. Uh, give them even opportunities to share uh, the gospel with people that they come in contact with. And Lord, I pray for us this week. Uh, that we will take steps of faith and that we will glorify you through it. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, First Baptist family. Thanks for joining us in worship today. Here are two announcements that are going to be helpful for you to know this week. Now, first of all, as we mentioned last week, half of the gymnasium roof is in need of replacing. So, the decision has been made to move forward with replacing one half of the roof of the gymnasium. However, in order for that to happen, one week from today, we as a congregation will need to vote for a new roof for half of the gymnasium. So, the funds for this roof will come first from the memorial fund, and any additional funds that are necessary will come from the capital improvements fund. So, as a reminder, that vote will be taking place one week from today on February 7th. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and direct your questions toward Pastor Pete or Andrew Hines. The second announcement is actually also concerning one week from today, February 7th. Next week, we're going to be having Larry and Sally Fogel joining us for worship. Now Larry Fogel will be preaching for us next week and will also be attending the Sunday night Bible study. With that, I have no more announcements, so if you are a first time guest here at First Baptist Church, we are glad that you joined us. We have a gift for you, so please be sure to stop by our guest center and pick up one of the gift mugs that we have set out for you. First Baptist family, have a wonderful week.